Chapter 11 of Superwomen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Superwomen by Albert Payson Terhune. Chapter 11 Madame Recamier, the Frozen Hearted Angel. Paris, the hopelessly mixed, sans culotte philosopher new paris society of seventeen ninety three took a holiday from red slaughter and reflection on the rights of man and went to an odd wedding the wedding of a fifteen-year-old girl to a man of nearly fifty probably even in that less bromidic day there were not lacking a few hundred guests to commit the ancient wheeze anent may and december the girl was a beauty of the type that it tightens one's throat to look at and the man was an egregiously rich banker so paris deigned to be interested interested even into momentary forgetfulness of the day's list of the condemned and of robespierre's newest patriotic murder dreams the girl bride was jean francois julie adelaide bernard daughter of no less a dignitary than the paris's receiver of taxes a mild-mannered and handsome man weak and stupid with a handsome and steel-eyed wife who was neither dull weak nor good the groom was jacques recamier by profession a powerful banker by choice a middle-class lothario his father had sold hats at Lyon. Recamier had been an intimate friend of the Bernards, forever at their house since a year or so before Jean had been born. As the wedding party stood on the steps of the Hotel de Ville, after the civil ceremony, so runs the story, a passing man halted and gazed long and closely at Jean in dumb admiration studying every line of her face and form the gazer was a painter Gruz by name and from jean recamier as he saw her that day he drew the inspiration for the wonderful jean Fille picture that made him immortal the wedding party filed into a line of waiting carriages but scarce had the joyous cavalcade set out on its short journey when it was halted by the passage of a truly horrible procession that just then emerged from a cross street a procession made up of scarecrow men and women hideous of visage clad in rags blood from the guillotine around which they had lately gathered gloating spattered on their clothes and unwashed faces in the midst of the howling and huzzahing throng was a chair carried by supports on the shoulders of eight half-naked sans culottes and in this lofty chair crouched the most hideous figure in all that vile gathering a dwarfish weirdly dressed man his face disgustingly marred by disease his eyes glaring with the light of madness around him gambled the mob screaming blessings and adulations strewing his bearers way with masses of wilted flowers filched from the hall thus did dr jean paul marat make his triumphal return home that april day from the convention escorted by his worshippers and fellow beasts thus did his obscene retinue block the wedding procession of dainty little jean recamier jean paul marat for whose shrunken chest at that very moment poor politics crazed charlotte corday was sharpening the twenty-eight cent case knife she had just bought an odd omen for the outset of married life and vitally so to the little new wed recamier girl who had been brought up amid superstitions shall we glance at a short word picture of jean limbed by a contemporary she has orange-tinted eyes but they are without fire pretty and transparent teeth but incapable of snapping 
and ungainly waist coarse hands and feet and complexion that is a bowl of milk wherein float rose leaves let me add to the sketch the established fact that during the seventy-one years of her life no man so such as boasted that he had received a caress or a love word from her but don't lose interest in her pleas on that account dozens of men would blithely have tossed away their souls for the privilege of making that boast truthfully failing they nicknamed her the angel of the frozen heart against her alone perhaps of all superwomen no word of scandal was ever breathed chiefly it has been claimed for physical reasons let me touch as briefly as i can on a story at which madame lenormand her own cousin broadly hints and which turcan openly declares true says the former among other and closer comments on the theme madame recamier received from her husband but his name his affection was paternal he treated as a daughter the woman who carried his name says turcan she was recamier's daughter and so by all testimony she was years before recamier had had a love affair with madame bernard an affair that the stupid bernard had condoned if he had known of its existence nor said gossip of the day was it madame bernard's sole indiscretion jean had been born from her earliest babyhood recamier had all but worshipped her not a day had passed but he had come to see her he had loaded her with toys jewelry candy he had been her fairy godfather she had grown up calling him daddy recamier then came the reign of terror old bernard's life was in considerable danger in fact he used to go to the guillotine daily to watch executions that he might become used to his fate madame bernard was no fit guardian for a young and incredibly lovely girl in the rotten paris of that day so recamier rich and powerful chose the surest means to safeguard the daughter who was all the world to him he went through a meaningless civil ceremony with her and installed her with a retinue of servants in one half of his big house then and thereafter she was madame recamier in name alone recamier tenderly watching over her giving her every luxury money could buy and observing with a total absence of jealousy her innumerable conquests these conquests had begun by the way even before jean's early marriage when she was but thirteen a young man named humblot had fallen madly in love with her to keep jean from reciprocating his flame she had been packed off to a convent school shortly after the marriage the reign of terror simmered down to the more peaceful if more corrupt directory society reassembled on its peak after the years of guillotine aided class leveling and in this heterogeneous society jean blazed forth as a star says sambouve the world madame recamier traversed at this period was very mixed and very ardent to its adoration the girl bride lent an amused but wholly impersonal ear vaguely she used to wonder why men wept at her feet and poured forth their souls in noisy love for her their antics found no response in her own untouched heart yet she found them interesting and therefore in a demure way she encouraged them not that such encouragement was really needed presently out of the chaos of social and political conditions arose napoleon bonaparte yes i know he appears unduly often in this series but he appeared unduly often in the lives of a score of superwomen madame jumel elizabeth patterson mademoiselle georges countess potoka and the rest and his name is more often seen in all history 
written since 1790, than that of any other man. So be patient if he crops up oftener than the balance of power seems to call for. Napoleon, first as dictator and then as emperor, ruled France. As a young man, he had been too poor and too busy to glance at any woman. Now, in his days of power and, for him, leisure, he amply made up for such early defects, and presently his alternately pale and jet-black eyes fell upon Jean Recamier. Forthwith he began to make right ardent love to her. Napoleon, once and only once in all his strange career, had actually lost his level head through love, and had been carried by it out of his cool, calculating self. That was when, as a lean, half-starved, hectic young officer of artillery, he had met Josephine Bohanne. She was a Creole widow, much older than he. Much slush has been written of her and her wrongs. History, from every source, tells another story. Napoleon used to meet Josephine at the house of the director Barras, where she held a somewhat equivocal position. Barras had begun to tire of her. Her teeth were bad. She was beginning to wrinkle and grow sallow. She was silly. She had absolutely nothing in common with the late Mrs. Caesar. To Napoleon, though, she was as a third-rate show to a country boy who had never before visited the theater. She was divine. Barras saw, and he also saw a chance to rid himself of a burden, and at the same time to attach to himself a growingly useful friend. Barras persuaded Josephine to marry Napoleon, whom she did not even pretend to love, by saying, that the young man had a great future. Then, as a wedding present, he gave Napoleon command of the ragged, mutinous army of Italy. Napoleon, after turning that army into such a fighting machine as the world had never before known, thrashed Italy and Austria, and came home the hero and idol of the hour, to find, beyond all doubt or hope, that Josephine was unfaithful to him. He ordered her out of his house. She wept. Her family wept. Everyone wept. Everyone pleaded. Napoleon shrugged his shoulders and let her stay. But ever thereafter, he treated her with mere friendly tolerance. His love for her was stone dead. And he amused himself wherever amusement could be found. Also, when it suited his turn in after years, he calmly divorced her. Le Favre, said Napoleon in Egypt, what is Josephine doing at this moment? Weeping for your return, promptly babbled the future Duke of Danzig. Le Favre, soulfully returned Napoleon, you're a fool, or a liar, or both. She is riding a white horse in the bois, in the worst kind of company she can find at such short notice. Men of rank and wit were choking Madame Recamier's salon to overflowing. She was the inaccessible goal of a hundred Don Juan's ambitions. Grandees of the old and the new regime as well, aristocrats of the noblesse, who would not deign to visit the Tuileries while the Corsican adventurer held sway in that house of kings, all flocked to the Recamier home and vied with one another to do Jean honor. Her beauty, her siren charm, her snowy or frosty virtue were the talk of France. What more natural than that Napoleon should seek out this new paragon, that sheer conceit as well as genuine love should make him burn to succeed where all the world had failed? Other women, women whose houses he could not have entered seven years earlier, save as a dependent, were making fools of themselves over the man of destiny. He had but to throw the handkerchief for a hundred frail beauties to scramble for its possession. 
irresistible perfect in power and in the serene knowledge of that power he deigned to make lazy love to jean recamier she was not used to lazy love-making she did not understand it but took it for a mere new mannerism of the hyper-manneristic emperor her seeming indifference had the same effect on napoleon as might a war campaign that promised grave obstacles it turned his idle fancy to keen pursuit madame recamier failed to be impressed napoleon thinking he must be mistaken in the idea that any living woman could fail to be dazzled by his attentions made his meaning quite clear only to meet with a very good-humoured but extremely definite rebuff from his charmer it was past his understanding he stooped to bribes offering to put a big share of the state finances through the recamier bank and with much pomp and ceremony announcing the appointment of madame recamier as one of the empress josephine's ladies-in-waiting this was a master stroke a tour de force a knockout anything you will for fat and curved-nosed bankers throughout the empire were yelping for slices of the state finances and the post of lady-in-waiting was one for which nearly any woman of the court would gladly have parted with all she no longer possessed then came a shock a rough jarring shock a shock worthy to be administered by instead of to the corsican himself madame recamier coldly refused the glittering offers declined to be a lady-in-waiting and gave napoleon to understand in terms he could not mistake that she wanted nothing from him except unadulterated absence it was probably the emperor's one heart rebuff in a burst of babyish fury he the ruler of france and the arbiter of europe's fate crawled so low as to seek revenge on a harmless woman he first wrecked the recamier bank driving old recamier to the verge of ruin then he trumped up an asinine charge of treason or les majestes or something equally absurd against jean and on the strength of it he banished her from paris it was a revenge well worthy the eccentric who could rule or ruin half of europe by a single convolution of his demigod brain or could screech in impotent fury at a valet for getting the wrong part in his thin hair from paris went the recamiers the banker seeking gently to console his unhappy wife for the ruin she had so innocently wrought and to build up for her bit by bit a new fortune to replace the lost one never by word or look did he blame her and speedily he amassed enough money to supply her again with the luxuries she loved to lyon the old home of both of them they went thence to rome and then to naples in italy jean met once more her dearest woman friend a ludicrously homely woman with the temper of a wet cat and a tongue sharp enough to shave with a complete foil mentally and facially for her bosom friend jean this miracle of homeliness was madame de stel author and futile conspirator for exercising the latter accomplishment she had been banished like jean from paris so ugly was madame de stel that when she once said to an ill-favored man you abuse the masculine prerogative of homeliness her hearers laughed at her not at her victim in italy too jean met prince augustus of prussia prince royal and a man of distinction and wealth they met at a reception madame recamier and madame de stal were seated side by side on a sofa after the introductions prince augustus seated himself between them 
remarking airily, I find myself placed between wit and beauty. And possessing neither, commented Madame de Stael with her wonted courtesy. The prince, from that inauspicious start, became the infatuated slave of Madame Recamier. He worshipped the ground she trod. He made no secret of his devotion. In those days, the title of Prince Royal carried real weight, and the gulf between prince and commoner was well-nigh unbridgeable. Love made Prince Augustus waive all this disparity. The fact that Madame Recamier was a mere commoner grew to mean nothing to him. At the risk of disgrace at home, and of possible loss of rank and fortune, the prince entreated Jean to divorce Recamier and to marry his royal-blooded self. It was a brilliant offer, one that ninety-nine commoners out of a hundred would have seized with alacrity, for it was not a morgantic union he proposed. He wanted to make Jean his princess. The prince went to Recamier and frankly stated his wishes. To his amaze, instead of challenging the wooer, Recamier at once agreed to let Jean get the divorce on any grounds she chose, or an annulment of their marriage, which would have been still simpler, and marry Prince Augustus. Always impersonal and adoring in his attitude towards Jean, Recamier now urged her to secure her own best interests by giving him up and becoming the prince's wife a sacrifice far easier to understand in a father than in a husband. But Jean put aside the offer without a tremor of hesitation, turning her back on the wealth and title of a princess in order to remain with the bankrupt old commoner whom the world called her husband. For, again, physical reasons intervened. Lucien Bonaparte, one of the emperor's several brothers, was another ardent wooer. He shone in reflected glory as his brother's brother until he seemed quite royal. But to him, as to all the rest, Jean, after a wholly harmless and pleasant flirtation, gave a decided refusal. General Bernadotte, on a foreign mission for the emperor, sought her out. He was a military chief who had fought like a hero, and on whom court honors had since fallen thick. He sought, soldier fashion, to carry Jean's icy defenses by storm, only to fail as all had failed, and to go home grumbling that his majesty had done well to exile so unapproachable a beauty before she had a chance to drive every man in France mad with chagrin. Benjamin Constant, too, cunning statesman of the old school, loved her, and in his strange, unfathomable mind she found a certain fascination, the more so when she discovered that she could twist that mind to her own purposes. So, instead of dismissing Constant like the rest, she made it clear that she did not love him and then kept him as a friend. Strong use did she make of that friendship, too, in revenging herself on Napoleon for banishing her. Constance's mighty, if tortuous, acts of statescraft, just before and just after Napoleon's downfall, have been laid to her influence. Another exile, General Moreau, Napoleon's oft-time rival in both war and love, now sought to win where his enemy had lost, and he failed. He was the same General Moreau, who, a few years earlier, had paid court to Betty Jumel, and had given her, as a love gift, a huge gilt and prism chandelier, which later hung in the Jumel mansion in New York. But he found Jean as cold as Betty had been kind, and in time he too departed hopeless. The next victim was no less a personage than the King of Naples. He was Murat, ex-tavern waiter peerless cavalry leader and husband of Napoleon's shrew sister, Caroline Bonaparte. The emperor, after conquering the separate Italian states, 
had placed his ex-waiter brother-in-law on the Neapolitan throne. When Jean reached Naples, Queen Caroline received her with open arms and invited her to be a guest at the palace. Murat's admiration for the lovely visitor was undisguisable, and, though it has been denied by one biographer that Jean was responsible for his treason, almost at once after her arrival he began to intrigue with Napoleon's enemies. Form your own conclusions, as did folk of the time. Soon afterward, weakened by the idiotic Russian campaign, Napoleon was set upon by a host of foes, men who had licked his boots fell over one another to join the alliance against him the lion was wounded and the dog pack was at his throat as soon as napoleon had been hustled off into exile the recamiers returned to paris as did practically all the army of people he had banished the banker's fortune was looking up and they could live in something of their old style there paris in those first weeks of the restoration was as full of kings emperors princes and dukes as a subway rush hour train of newspaper readers one could hardly walk a block without stumbling over a monarch or a commander-in-chief or a princeling the heads of the allied armies were still there strutting gallantly about they would have run up a tree two years earlier and bragging of napoleon's fall there was Alexander, Tsar of Russia, gigantic and bear-like, who had once cringed to Napoleon, then frozen and starved him in the Moscow campaign, and now was one of the chiefs of the alliance. There, too, was Blucher, who had tumbled off his horse at Waterloo, but who, nonetheless, had done more than is placed to his credit to win the victory that forever crushed Napoleon it was he and his prussians not wellington and the english who really won waterloo for the allies other sovereigns other generals there were too and foremost among them a long lean irishman with a bony face and a great hooked beak of a nose he was arthur wellesley duke of wellington titular victor of waterloo and man of the hour the duke of wellington was not happily married i think no retroactive libel law can attack me for saying this for he himself made no secret of it and he was far from being an exponent to stern british morality indeed one object of his affections miss jenkins wrote of him to a friend it was all i could do to prevent his grace from throwing himself on his knees before me in sinful adulation I fear he would have roused crass horror in the bosom of the mid-Victorian matron, who, on seeing Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, exclaimed, How different was Cleopatra's home life from that of our own gracious queen! The duke fell victim to Jean Recamier's charm. He, the official man of the hour, became a fixture at her salons, but for a very brief time. One day, when he was calling on her, a number of other guests being present, the Duke made some would-be witty remark about France. Jean chose to interpret his words as a slur on her beloved country. Roused for once from her wonted gentleness, she ordered Wellington out of her house. By the next day, all Paris knew that Madame Recamier had shown the omnipotent Duke of Wellington the door, and all Paris which adored Jean and hated the English hero, went wild with delight. Jean's popularity from that moment was boundless. Soon afterward, Wellington found that stern duty called him, somewhat hastily, to London. Whither, to his disgust, the story of his ejectment from Madame Recamier's salon had preceded him. Canova, the premier sculptor of his day, he who later paid such assiduous court to Elizabeth Patterson, fell in love with Jean. So indelibly was her wonder face stamped on his mind that, without her knowing it, he was able to make two busts of her. When the busts were done, Canova, 
who was constantly receiving and rejecting offers of fabulous sums to make portrait busts showed her his labors of love but jean's beauty went hand in hand with vanity she thought the busts over which he had toiled so happily did not do her justice and without a word she turned away from the inspection and left the studio the sharp blow to his pride was too much for canova he dropped her acquaintance forever being perhaps the only one of jean's adorers to break his allegiance to her before she gave the word recamier died jean rich and still gloriously beautiful received shoals of proposals she rejected them all she had at last met the love of her life in the lives of all these superwomen you will have noticed there was some one man who stood out supreme above all the host of lesser lovers idolized placed on a lofty pedestal a wealth of devotion lavished on him and so it was with jean recamier although the affair from first to last was starkly platonic she who had laughed at an emperor who had rejected a prince's hand who had turned the most famous man in europe out of her house lost her head and her heart to a cranky bear-like author adventurer francois auguste de chateaubriand your grandmother read and wept over his american novel atala chateaubriand was a heartbreaker as a mere youth his talent for transferring his allegiance with lightning speed from one woman to the next had won him the sobriquet l'inconstant he had travelled in the american wilderness living among indian tribes had hobnobbed with george washington to whom he had brought letters of introduction had been sent fleeing for his life from france during the terror had been a favorite of napoleon's until the corsican's tyranny disgusted him into turning conspirator of late years he had wandered aimlessly about europe making love and earning a scant living as a painter and writer sometimes broke sometimes flush sometimes acclaimed as a genius sometimes chased as a political criminal sometimes in palaces sometimes in jail chateaubriand at length met jean recamier from the first they loved each other on neither side with it a crazily passionate adoration rather was it the full calm devotion of mature hearts that seek safe harbor after many and battering storms when recamier died chateaubriand formally asked jean's hand in marriage she refused for reasons best known to herself and her physician but they remained for all the rest of their lives faithful and utterly devoted lovers chateaubriand was uncouth morbid vain bristling with a myriad foibles and faults jean very gently and tactfully undertook to cure him of these defects with tender hands she gradually remoulded his wayward eccentric nature stripping away much of its dross bringing out its cleaner nobler traits you have transformed my character he wrote her i know nothing more beautiful nor more good than you when recamier died in eighteen thirty jean was a little over fifty chateaubriand was sixty-two a mature couple with all yet jean looked scarce thirty and chateaubriand was still in his late prime again and again he pleaded with jean to marry him always she refused just as she refused a host of others even in her mature years indeed she received and rejected a proposal of marriage when she was seventy the rest of this story is not especially romantic perhaps it may not interest you for it has to do with the breaking up of things the recamier chateaubriand affair went on like an indian summer for years then as old age reached out for him chateaubriand's eccentricities cropped out afresh he fell into a melancholy 
shut himself away from the world that was at last growing to honor him became a recluse and would see no one except madame recamier his melancholy deepened almost into mania he had but one dream of life left in his heart his love for jean to her he clung like a frightened child to a tender mother then in its saddest form old age laid its cold hand across beautiful jean's orange-tinted eyes and she became totally blind even in her blindness she was still lovely and her soul lost none of its sweetness sightless she still guarded and sought to amuse the cranky old man she so long had loved bearing with his once imperious temper which had now rotted into mere whining discontent humoring his million whims talking softly to him in his brighter moments about the gleaming past the melancholy old man lovingly tended and nursed and amused like a baby by the blind old woman who had been the reigning beauty of the world lingered on for several years longer when at last he died jeanne mourned him as never had she mourned recambier or any other chateaubriand's death broke her heart it broke too her last tie to earth and within a few months she followed her lover to the grave thus at seventy-two died jean recamier virgin heartbreaker whose very name was for half a century the synonym for absolute beauty and flawless purity i know of no other superwoman whose character in any way resembles hers which was perhaps more unlucky for the other superwoman than for the men who loved them End of chapter 11. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 12 of Superwomen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Superwomen by Albert Payson Terhune. Chapter 12. Lady Hamilton, patron saint of dime novel heroines. She was the mother of Gertrude the governess, the grand dame of Bertha, the beautiful sewing machine girl, the earliest ancestorette of Ione, the pride of the mill, she was the impossibility that made possible the brain daughters of laura jean she was the patron saint of all the dime novel heroines she was the model consciously or otherwise probably otherwise of all their authors because at a period when such things were undreamed of even in fiction she rose from nursemaid to title even in the books and plays of that age the born serving wench did not marry the heir in the highest literary flights bridget's crowning reward was to wed luke the gamekeeper and become landlady of the bibulous goat or the doodlethorpe arms goldsmith was eyed askance for even making the heroine of she stoops to conquer pose momentarily as a lady's maid having thus tried to show how impossible was the happening let me work up by degrees to the happening itself she was a lancashire lass emma lyon by name in mature years she dropped the lion and called herself emma hart no one knows why lyon was not her name neither was hart for that matter in fact she had no name her careless parents having failed to supply her with the legal right to one her father was a rural farmhand he died while emma was a baby her mother an inn servant moved later to hawarden and there a mrs thomas hired emma as nursemaid this was in seventeen seventy seven emma was thirteen she had already learned to read a rare accomplishment in those days for the nameless brat of an inn drudge and as nursemaid 
she greedily picked up stray morsels of her little charge's education as well as the manners and language of her employers she learned as quickly as a chinaman there is a hiatus in the records after emma had served a year or so in the thomas family one biographer bridges the gap with a line of asterisks asterisks in biographies as well as in sex problem fiction may indicate either a lapse of time or a lapse of morals emma reappeared from the asterisk cloud in london where she was nursemaid in the house of a dr budd one of the physicians at st bartholomew's hospital dr budd's housemaid at that time by the way later became a drury lane star under the name of mrs powell and in that bright after day she and the even more apotheosized emma renewed their below stairs friendship for some reason emma left dr budd's service rather suddenly and found a job as helper in the shop of a st james market mercer she was sixteen and she was gloriously beautiful her figure was superb already she had a subtle charm of her own which drew to her feet crowds of footmen shop boys apprentices and such small deer there is no record that they one and all were sent away disconsolate during her brief career as helper to the st james market mercer emma chanced to attract the notice of a woman of quality who one day entered the shop and forthwith she was hired as lady's maid the girl had picked up a smattering of education she had scraped from her pink tongue the rough lancashire burr she had learned to speak correctly to ape the behavior of the solid folk whose servant she had been now from her new employer she was to learn at first hand how people in the world of fashion comported themselves and chameleon-like she took on the color of her gay surroundings soon she could lisp such choice and fashionable expletives as scrape me raw and oh lay me bleedin and could talk and walk and posture as did her mistress trashy novels by the dozen fell into her hands from her mistress's table emma devoured them gluttonously and absorbed their precepts as the human system absorbs alcohol fumes please don't for one moment get the idea that there was anything profitable to a young girl in the novels of the latter eighteenth century perhaps you have in mind such dreary sterling works as pamela clarissa harlow sir charles grandison and others that were crammed into your miserably protesting brain in the literature courses those were the rare the very rare exceptions to a large and lurid list which included such choice classics as moll flanders roxana both of them by the same defoe who wrote robinson crusoe and whose other novels would send a present-day publisher to state's prison peregrine pickle fanny hill the delicate distress roderick random and the rest of a rank-flavored multitude emma reveled in the joys of the local circulating library too one of those places that loaned books of a sort to cause even the kindly sheridan to thunder his famous dictum a circulating library in a town is an evergreen tree of diabolical knowledge it blossoms through the year and depend on t they who are so fond of handling the leaves will long for the fruit at last much reading filled emma with wonderful new ideas of life incidentally it made her neglect her work and she was discharged her next step was to become barmaid in a tavern while she was there a young admirer of hers was seized by the navy press gang emma went to the captain of the ship to beg for her swain's release the captain was john willett payne afterward a rear admiral Payne granted the lovely girl's plea. He not only gave her what she asked, but his own admiration as well. Her story as a heart winner had begun. In fiction, the gallant captain would soon have tired of his lively sweetheart and cast her aside, but 
emma was not a lowly sweetheart she was a superwoman she showed how much stranger than fiction truth may be by deserting pain for a richer man first however she had wheedled the captain into hiring tutors and music masters for her and she profited vastly by their teachings her new flame was a sporting baronet sir harry featherstonhaugh of up park sussex sir harry was an all-around athlete and a reckless horseman he taught emma to ride a beggar on horseback and she became the most daring equestrienne of the century he taught her to spend money too and so splendidly did she learn her lesson that inside of a year sir harry was bankrupt perhaps all rats do not leave a sinking ship but for very good reasons one never hears anything further of the rats that don't the rat that wishes to continue his career wastes no time in joining the exodus and emma lyon did not disdain to take example from the humble rodent there seemed no good reason for remaining longer at the side of the bankrupt baronet to add to his cares and expenses so with womanly consideration she left him she was alone in the world once more without a shilling or a friend equipped with education accomplishments wondrous beauty and charm but with no immediate market for those commodities it was the black hour that comes least once into the life of every adventuress and in this time of need she fell in with a beauty culture quack graham by name graham had devised a rejuvenation medicine from dr faustus down the world has feverishly piteously seized on every nostrum advertised as a means of exchanging age for youth and he vowed that it would make its users not only young again but maddeningly beautiful as an example of after using graham exhibited emma lyon who he said had once been old and ugly and who by a course of his elixir had become youthful and glorious he called his medicine megalanthropogenesis women who heard his lecture took one look at emma and then bought out graham's ready supply of the stuff the charlatan was an artist in gaining his effects as witness a report of the exhibition in which emma posed he had contrived a bed of apollo or celestial bed on which in a delicately colored light this exquisitely beautiful woman nearly naked was gradually unveiled to soft soft music as hygieia goddess of health presumably no effort was made by any eighteenth-century comstock to suppress this show and all london flocked and thronged and jostled to behold it apart from the normal crowd of idlers came painters and sculptors to gaze in delight on the perfect face and form revealed through the shimmer of rose-coloured light and foremost of these artists was a freakish genius toward whom was slowly creeping the insanity that a few years later was to claim him and whose stealthy approach he was even then watching with horror he was george romney who with sir joshua reynolds divided the homage of england's art world romney had come to stare at emma he remained to worship he engaged her as his model and soon or late painted no less than thirty-nine pictures of her i call her the divine lady he once wrote for i think she is superior to all womankind the black hour was past emma lyon's fortune and fame were secure thanks to romney she was the best advertised beauty on earth conquests came thick and fast not treading on one another's heels but racing abreast soon out of the ruck and forging far ahead appeared charles francis greville wit art connoisseur and nephew and heir of the famed antiquary diplomat sir william hamilton 
Greville cut out all rivals, Romney among the rest, and one Emma for his own. Theirs was an odd love affair, for here too Emma gave full rein to her craving for education, and she showed for the first time just why she was so eager to be highly educated. It was not for mere learning's sake, but to enhance the charm that gave her a hold over men. She cared nothing for any but the showy accomplishments. She already had a fair groundwork in English and ordinary school studies. She made Greville get her the best teachers in singing, in dancing, in acting. Perhaps she looked forward to a stage triumph, but more likely to outshining the colorless bread-and-butter women of her day. Never did pupil better repay the pains of her teachers. Her voice presently rivaled that of many a prima donna. Her dancing was a delight. It was she who conceived the celebrated shawl dance that was the rage throughout Europe for years thereafter, and that still is used in very slightly modified form by premiere danseuse. But acting was Emma's fort, says a contemporary writer. With a common piece of stuff, she could so arrange and clothe herself as to offer the most appropriate representations of a Jewess, a Roman matron, a Helen, Penelope, or Aspasia. No character seemed foreign to her, and the grace she was in the habit of displaying under such representations excited the admiration of all who were fortunate enough to be present on such occasions. Siddons could not surpass the grandeur of her style, or O'Neill be more melting in the utterance of deep pathos. In this heyday of her prosperity, Emma hunted up her aged and disreputable mother, bestowed on her the name Mrs. Cadigan, and settled a rich pension on her. At about the same time, too, Emma bade a cheery farewell to the serviceable name of Lyon, and took to calling herself Emma Hart. Then Greville went broke. In his new-found poverty, he hit on a plan of life foreign to all his old ideas. He decided to ask his rich old uncle, Sir William Hamilton, to pay his debts and settle a little annuity on him. With his sum as a means of livelihood, he intended to marry Emma, and with her and their three children, settled down in some cheap suburb. How this appealed to Emma, history forgets to say. Judging by both past and future, it is not unjust to suppose that she may have been making ready once more to emulate the ship-deserting rat. But this time she did not need to. The ship was about to desert her, for a consideration. Greville, full of his new hopes, went to Sir William Hamilton and laid the plan before him. His nephew's derelictions from the straight and narrow path had long distressed the virtuous old diplomat. And in Greville's financial troubles, Sir William thought he saw a fine chance to break off his nephew's discreditable affair with Emma. He offered to set Greville on his feet again if that luckless youth would drop Emma's acquaintance. The enamoured Greville refused. Sir William insisted, raising his offer of financial aid and pointing out, with tearful eloquence, the family disgrace that a marriage to a woman of Emma's dissolute character must cause. It was all quite like a scene from a modern problem play. But fate, her tongue in her cheek, was preparing to put a twist on the end of the scene worthy of the most cynical French vaudeville writer. Greville resented his uncle's rash judgment of his adored Emma, and begged him to come and see her for himself, hoping that Emma's wonder charm might soften the old man's virtue-encrusted heart. Reluctantly, Sir William consented to one brief interview with the wicked siren. At sight of Emma, Sir William's heart melted to mushiness, he fell crazily in love with the woman he had come to dispossess. There was another long and stormy scene between uncle and nephew, after which Greville, for an enormous lump sum, 
transferred to Sir William Hamilton all right and title and goodwill to the adorable Emma Hart. And Sir William and Emma departed thence, arm in arm, leaving Greville a sadder but a richer man. What became of the three children I don't know. By the way, Emma had taught them to call her aunt, not mother. Will you let me quote a deadly dry line or two from an encyclopedia to prove to you how important a personage Sir William was, and how true is the axiom about no fool like an old fool? Hamilton, Sir William, British Diplomatist and Antiquary, 1730 to 1803 student of art philosophy and literature from seventeen sixty four to eighteen hundred english ambassador to the court of naples trustee of british museum fellow of the royal society vice president of the society of antiquaries distinguished member of the dilettante club author of several books sir joshua reynolds his intimate friend painted his portrait which hangs in the National Gallery. Sir William, who was home on leave of absence when he met Emma, took her back with him to Italy. But before they sailed, she had prevailed on him to marry her. It was easy. He was old. The marriage was kept secret until, in 1791, she led her husband back to England on another leave of absence, and up to the altar of St. George's Church, where, on September 6 of that year, they were married all over again, this time with every atom of publicity Emma could compass. She was then 27. Her husband was 61. In state, they returned to the court of Naples, the most corrupt, licentious, false, utterly abominable court in all Europe. If you will glance at the annals of the courts of that period, you will find this statement is as true as it is sweeping. On her earlier visit, as the supposed brevet bride of the ambassador, Emma had been warmly received by Marie Caroline, Queen of Naples and sister to Marie Antoinette of France. Emma and Marie Caroline were kindred spirits, which is perhaps the unkindest thing I could say about either of them, and they quickly formed a lasting friendship for each other. Emma was glad to get back to Naples. Apart from her marriage, her visit to England had not been a success. A certain element in London society, attracted by her beauty, her voice, and her talent as an actress, had taken her up, but Queen Charlotte had refused her a presentation at the British court, and the more reputable element of the nobility had followed royal example, and given her a wide berth. English society under George the Third was severely respectable, at least in the matter of externals, a quality it was soon to mislay under George the Fourth. Hence Emma's joy at returning to a court where respectability was a term to be found only in the dictionary. The King of Naples was a fool. His wife was the little kingdom's ruler, Emma, Lady Hamilton, became her chief adviser, writes one historian. It is not too much to say of these two women that for years they wielded the destinies of Naples and seriously affected the character of the wars that ended with the peace of Europe in 1815 when both were dead. Both were endowed with powers of mind far above the average of their sex both exhibited energy and understanding that inspired them to bold and decisive if not always laudable deeds both were as remarkable for their personal beauty as for their self-reliance their knowledge of men and their determination to make the most of their information to say that marie caroline loved lady hamilton is to misstate a fact there was no love in the royal composition but her ungovernable and undying hatred of the French inclined her, no doubt, in the first instance toward the wife of the English ambassador, and the subsequent devotion of the favorite secured an attachment that is confessed and reiterated through whole pages of a vehement 
and overstrained correspondence. Naples just then was between two fires. There was fear of a French invasion, which arrived on schedule time, and there was also danger that England would ruin Neapolitan commerce. Emma's white hands were at once plunged, wrist deep, into the political dough, and a sorry mess she proceeded to make of it. For example, the King of Spain wrote a confidential letter to his brother, the King of Naples, accusing the English government of all sorts of public and private crimes, and telling of Spain's secret alliance with France. The king showed it to his wife, who in turn showed it to Lady Hamilton. Emma stole and secretly sent the letter to the British cabinet. The result was a bloody war between England and Spain. About two years after Emma's marriage, an English warship, the Agamemnon, touched at Naples, and her captain called to pay his respects to the British ambassador and to deliver a letter from the admiral of the Mediterranean fleet. After a few minutes' talk with the captain, Sir William insisted that the latter should meet Lady Hamilton. He bustled into the drawing-room to prepare Emma for the visitor's arrival, saying excitedly to her, I am bringing you a little man who cannot boast of being very handsome, but who, I pronounce, will one day astonish the world. I know it from the very words of conversation I have had with him. On the heels of Sir William's announcement, the little man came into the room. At first glance, he scarcely seemed to justify Hamilton's enthusiasm. He was clad in a full-laced uniform. His lank, unpowdered hair was tied in a stiff hessian queue of extraordinary length. Old-fashioned, flaring waistcoat flaps added to the general oddity of his figure. Sir William introduced him as Captain Horatio Nelson. Lady Hamilton lavished on the queer guest no especial cordiality. It is not known that she gave him a second thought. Nelson, little more impressed by the superwoman, wrote to his wife in England an account of the call, saying of Lady Hamilton, whose story, of course, he and everybody knew, She is a young woman of amiable manners, who does honor to the station to which she has been raised. Yet Nelson had unwittingly met the woman who was to tarnish the pure glory of his fame, and Emma had met the man but for whom she would to-day be forgotten. So little does fate forecast her dramas that, at the first meeting, neither of the two immortal lovers seems to have felt any attraction for the other. Not for five busy years did Nelson and Emma Hamilton see each other again. Then Nelson came back to Naples, this time in triumph, a world-renowned hero, the champion of the seas, Britain's idol. He had become an admiral, a peer of England, a scourge of his country's foes. Back to Naples he came. Part of him, not all, for victorious warfare had set cruel marks on him. He had left his right eye at Calvi in 1794, and his right arm at Tenerife in 1797. He was more odd-looking than ever, but he was an acclaimed hero, and Naples in general, and Emma Hamilton in particular, welcomed him with rapture. He was in search of the French fleet, and he wanted the King of Naples to let him reprovision his ships in the Neapolitan harbor. Now, France and Naples just then happened to be at peace, and by their treaty, no more than two English warships at a time could enter any Neapolitan or Sicilian port. The King's Council declared the treaty must stand. Lady Hamilton decided otherwise. She used all her power with the Queen to have the treaty set aside. As a result, Marie Caroline issued an order directing all governors of the two Sicilies to water, victual, and aid Nelson's fleet. This order made it possible for Nelson to go forth reprovisioned and to crush the French in the Battle of the Nile. 
in the first rumor of this battle that reached naples nelson was reported killed soon afterward he appeared alive and well in the harbor here is his letter to his wife telling how lady hamilton received him on his return nelson by the way had been married for nearly twelve years he and his wife were devoted to each other judging from this letter he was lamentably ignorant of women or was incredibly sure of lady nelson's love and trust or else his courage was greater than that of mortal husband he wrote sir william and lady hamilton came out to sea to meet me they my most respectable friends had nearly been laid up and seriously ill first from anxiety and then from joy it was imprudently told lady hamilton in a moment that i was alive and the effect was like a shot she fell apparently dead and is not yet perfectly recovered from severe bruises alongside came my honored friends the scene in the boat was terribly affecting up flew her ladyship and exclaiming oh god is it possible she fell into my arms more dead than alive tears however soon set matters to rights when alongside came the king i hope some day to have the pleasure of introducing you to lady hamilton she is one of the very best women in the world she is an honor to her sex her kindness with sir williams to me is more than i can express i am in their house and i may tell you it required all the kindness of my friends to set me up lady hamilton intends writing to you may god almighty bless you and give us in due time a happy meeting france sought revenge for the help given to nelson's fleet and declared war on naples the neapolitans in fury at being dragged into such a needless conflict rose against their dear king and adored queen especially against their adored queen and threatened to kill them by lady hamilton's aid the royal family reached nelson's flagship and took refuge there from the mob sir william and lady hamilton went along the populace looted the british embassy and stole everything of value sir william owned about one hundred and ninety five thousand dollars worth of property in all thus hamilton was the third man who had lost a fortune through emma meanwhile nelson had sailed to palermo taking the fugitives along there he made his home with the hamiltons and scandal awoke even in that easy-going crowd nor did the scandal die down to any appreciable extent on the birth of lady hamilton's daughter horatia a year or so later sir william's conduct in the matter is still a puzzle he felt or professed to feel that there was no occasion for jealousy and so for a long time the trio shared the same house one of the courtiers who had fled with the king and queen to palermo was prince caraccioli nelson's close friend and lady hamilton's bitter enemy caraccioli asked leave to go back to naples to look after his endangered property as soon as he reached the city he threw in his lot with the rebels and was made admiral of their navy presently by the aid of england's fleet the royal family returned the rebellion was put down and the king and queen were once more seated firmly on their thrones the rebel leaders were seized and brought to trial nelson is said to have promised immunity to caraccioli if he would surrender relying on his friend's pledge caraccioli surrendered at emma's request nelson had the overtrustful man hanged from the yardarm of his own flagship this is the darkest smear on nelson's character a smear that even his most blatant admirers have never been able to wipe away it is not in keeping with anything else in his life but by this time he belonged to lady hamilton body and soul she by the way had managed to acquire from her friend the queen of naples a nice tendency toward bloodthirstiness as witness the following sweet anecdote by prin lockhart gordon 
who tells of dining with the hamiltons at palermo in company with a turkish officer in the course of conversation the officer boasted that with the sword he wore he had put to death a number of french prisoners look he said there is their blood remaining on it when the speech was translated to her lady hamilton's eyes beamed with delight oh let me see the sword that did the glorious deed she exclaimed taking the sword in her hands which were covered with jewels she looked at it then kissed the encrusted blood on the blade and passed it on to nelson only one who was a witness to the spectacle can imagine how disgusting it was enshrined once more at naples hailed as saviour of the realm acclaimed for her share in the nile victory the confidant of royalty it would be pleasant to say good-bye here to emma lyon ex-nursemaid ex-barmaid ex-lady's maid nameless offspring of a lancashire inn slavey it was the climax of a wonderful life but there was anticlimax a plenty to follow nelson went home to england to receive the plaudits of his fellow countrymen and to settle accounts with his wife home too came the hamiltons sir william having been recalled lady nelson was not at the dock to meet her hero husband bad news travelled fast even before we boosted it along by wire and then by wireless lady nelson had heard and lady nelson was waiting at home thither blithely enough fared the man in whose praise a million englishmen were cheering themselves hoarse and in whose silver buckled shoes perhaps no married englishman would just then have cared or dared to stand but nelson was a hero he went home i once had a collie puppy that had never chanced to be at close quarters with a cat i was privileged to see him when he made his first gleefully fearless attack upon one ignorant of the potential anguish tucked away behind a feline's velvety paws somehow with no disrespect to a great man i always think of that poor about to be disillusioned puppy when i try to visualize the picture of nelson's homecoming just what happened no one knows but whatever it was it did not teach nelson the wisdom of husbandly reticence for a few weeks later he remarked at breakfast i have just received another letter from dear lady hamilton i am sick of hearing of dear lady hamilton flared the long-suffering wife you can choose between us you must give up her or me take care fanny warned nelson i love you dearly but i cannot forget all i owe to dear lady hamilton this is the end then announced lady nelson and she left the house only once again did she and her husband meet nelson cast off all pretense at concealment after his wife left him his affair with lady hamilton became public property their daughter horatia was openly acclaimed by him as his heiress the english were in a quandary they loved nelson they hated the woman who had dragged his name into the filth they could not snub her without making him unhappy they could not honor him without causing her to shine by reflected glory it was unpleasant all around in eighteen o five the deadlock was broken nelson was again to fight the french he told lady hamilton and many others that this campaign was to end in his death he ordered his coffin made ready for him then he sailed against the french fleet met it off cape trafalgar and annihilated it in the thick of the fight a musket ball gave him his death wound he was carried below and there the battle raging around him he laboriously wrote a codicil to his will entreating his king and country to repay his services by settling a pension on lady hamilton then to his next in command he panted i am going fast come nearer 
pray let my dear lady hamilton have my hair and all other things belonging to me take care of my dear lady hamilton poor lady hamilton thank god i have done my duty and so he died this knightly little demigod true lover false husband who had fouled his snowy escutcheon for a worthless woman now comes the inevitable anticlimax all england turned with loathing from lady hamilton her husband was dead lovers stood aloof folk who had received her for nelson's sake barred their doors against her she had followed the popular custom of living in luxury on nothing a year now her creditors swarmed upon her her house was sold for debt next she lived in bond street lodgings growing poorer day by day until she was condemned to the debtor's prison a kind-hearted or hopeful alderman bought her out of jail a former coachman of hers whose wages were still unpaid threatened her with arrest for debt she fled to calais there she lived in an attic saved from absolute starvation by a fellow englishwoman a mrs hunter her youth and charm had fled the power that had lured nelson and greville and hamilton to ruin was gone in 1815 she died she was buried in a pine box with an old black silk petticoat for a pall no clergyman could be found to take charge of her funeral so the burial service was read by a fellow debt exile a half-pay irish army captain one wonders perhaps morbidly if nelson's possible punishment in another world might not have been the knowledge of what befell his dear lady hamilton in her latter days end of chapter twelve recording by linda johnson end of superwomen by albert payson terhune